Welcome to the Retro Horror Academy. My name is Daniel Richardson, and yeah, on this episode we're going to be covering the year in horror 1924, although that's kind of a lie because like many years this decade, there's not a lot going on per se except for the films we're covering, so... Uh, so we'll get into that in just a moment, but the first thing I want to talk about, we're going to be adding a new segment to the show. See, I have covered, my God, 28 years of horror just on this series alone. And as we all know, because we live in the year 2022, that I haven't even scratched the surface of horror. No. 28 years of horror, and we're still in the silent era. We haven't got to the talkies, to the universal monster explosion, to the sci-fi horror films of the 50s, to just the crazy shit in the 70s, the slasher boom of the 80s, all the way up to now. I haven't touched any of that yet. We have literally only scratched the surface. However, 28 years is still, that's a lot of time right there. So... And you know how the show works. I come on here and I say, hey, we're going to cover this year. And, you know, I'll usually talk about, you know, what was going on in the world of horror films that year. And then we'll rank the horror movies. Uh, full disclosure, initially, uh, the plan was always to kind of do just the top ten horror films of that year. And that's it. Just cover those. Uh, maybe do honorable, men honorable mentions at some point. I don't know. But for the most part, it was just going to be rank the top ten horror films. Uh, and then, of course, hand out three awards, the Bronze Skull, the Silver Skull, and the Golden Skull to the top three horror films that year. Uh, however, you know, because we're still in the beginning processes and there just wasn't, A, there wasn't a lot of horror films coming out each year, or B, when there was a lot of horror films coming out, they were lost, lost films that are just now lost to the sands of time. But either way, we've yet to, I think the most we've had on this show in one year, I think we've done a six back in 1920. And so, yeah, typically, though, we kind of average out one to two movies a year. Much is the case of today. We're, we got two, two films to rank for you, uh, rank and review for you right here on the Retro Horror Academy. However, I want to give a little bit more because I feel like, you know, it's great that we're kind of showcasing, you know, spotlighting these films. But we really should be shining that light on the people who brought these films to us. The, you know, whether they're the actors and actresses in front of the camera or the people behind the camera who are, you know, getting us forward. You know, whether it be director, writers, producers, special effect artists, you know, whatever. Either way, you know, the people who make these films, uh, they deserve, you know, their day in the sun as well. And so with this episode, I have decided to add a new segment, the horror Hall of Fame. That's right. We are beginning our own, our own Hall of Fame right here on the on the Retro Horror Academy, and we will be uh, yeah handing out uh, the we'll be inducting. Sorry, won't be handing out awards. We'll be inducting these people into the uh, Hall of Fame. Now I want to lay down some ground rules right off the bat because I feel like this is going to get messy, and I'm sure this will be you know questions will come up in later episodes, and I'll constantly refer them back to the very first one right here. But uh, here's a couple of the rules starting off. One, like right off the bat, I'm not going to give this to like Wes Craven or John Carpenter. I am looking at these, uh, this Hall of Fame as I do these awards. I'm looking at them, you know, through the point of view of the year we're talking about. So in this situation, it's 1924. I'll be looking at this from the perspective of 1924, meaning Craven and Carpenter aren't even born yet. So why would I give them fucking awards, right? Like, that don't make any sense. That'd be like me trying to give out an award to someone who ain't going to be on the scene for another 30 or 40 years plus, and then it'd be like, yeah, we'll give them an award today because they're going to be born soon. No, no, that's ridiculous. So, yeah, if you're going to be asking, like, well, why didn't you know me? It's because they haven't even come around yet. So, there. Uh, secondly, you know, we got a couple of big heavy hitters, you know, actor-wise, director-wise, that are, you know, really killing it right now in the 20s. Uh, I'm Horrible at pronounc or pronouncing these names, so forgive me. But you know, we got like Lon Chaney, Conrad Veet, Vertit, however you pronounce it, uh, Paul Wagner, uh, Robert Wine. You know, these are you know heavyweights right now in the genre of horror. Uh, however, you know, I want a little seasoning 
on my inductees. You know, I want some veterans to go into the, the Hall of Fame. These guys are still currently working. It'd be ridiculous to give an award. It's like today if I gave an award to Jordan Peele to join the Hall of Fame. Hey, guess what? He'll get there eventually. Believe me, there's no doubt in my mind. But it's way too early to do that right now. The man's literally working right now. And I feel the same way about, you know, throwing like Lon Chaney in there. I feel like, you know, yeah, he's a legend and he will get into the Hall of Fame. But right now, it's like he's still working. We haven't even got to Fam the Opera yet. So it's like, yeah, we're not inducting him to the Hall of Fame. So keep that in mind as well. I want, you know, the people I'm going to be inducting will be people who have worked, you know, for a while in horror. So. And I think, you know, without any further ado, let's just get into it. My uh, first inductee into the Horror Hall of Fame, as voted on by the Retro Horror Academy. And forgive me for misspelling this name or mispronouncing this guy's name, uh, George Milas. Uh, George Milas, the reason he's in here is because I felt it was only right that, you know, he directed the very first horror film, The House of the Devil. It, to me, it only seems right that uh, he gets the very first induction into the Horror Hall of Fame. Uh, George Milis, uh he didn't just you know direct the very first horror film. He directed a lot of first everything. Like This guy was creating the genres and putting it on the screen before some of these genres even had words. You know, Again, we're talking horror, sci-fi, fantasy. And that's the thing. He was doing a lot of genre films before you know, that was even you know, a thing. Um, he did all kinds. I mean, I, I want to say no one knows for sure how many movies this guy's done, but it's like well over 500. Now, granted, a lot of these were short films, but at a time when there was no films, people only used you know the camera uh, to document things. Yes, there was documentaries like that, but there was no like plot stories, you know, no, no nothing like that. And this guy kind of changed the game on that. Not only did he change the game on that, he introduced special effects. He knew that you know using the camera. You don't just have to shoot everything for what it is. You can cheat. You can do whatever you want uh, to give the illusion of, you know, ghost walking around or people changing sizes or teleportation or flying or whatever. This guy did all of that. Uh, in addition to doing films like, you know, House of the Devil, uh, which we covered and has a golden skull here on the uh, Retro Horror Academy. You know, he's done a lot of other shorts, uh, notable films like... Uh, Oh, a terrible night! The many, uh, the many frolics of Satan, or the merry frolics of Satan, or the four hundred tricks of the devil. It goes by many names, but that's by his most fantastical work uh, within the genre of horror: the monster, uh, the infernal cakewalk, uh, the devil's cauldron. I believe is one of them. I mean, the guy literally he has done so many. In fact, a lot of them we have uh, put on our public domain dungeon DVD. And uh, given new audios and everything. So, I mean, the guy is a legend. Uh, on top of that, you know, films like A Trip to the Moon. Uh, he did the underwater one, which I'm blanking on right now. But either way, I mean, the guy was just a master of film. And honestly, I mean, I'm not saying that we wouldn't have got here eventually. But who knows what path that would have looked like without this guy kind of stepped up to the bat and just innovating all these genres. So... Yeah, without question, this guy is in the Horror Hall of Fame. The first inductee, George Milas. Yeah, I, I, I probably will make something. I don't know. So when I was doing the video version of this show, I actually made the Golden, Silver, and uh, Bronze Skull Awards. Never with an intention to hand it out. But I always feel like if you know somebody came to me, like a descendant of these you know filmmakers who made these movies, and be like, hey, I want the award. Uh, I'd give it to him. I mean, I, I, I'd mail him one. So I don't say anything about the Hall of Fame, I guess, that someone can verify that they're literally the uh, descendant of one of these uh, uh, Hall of Fame inductees. Uh, yeah, I'd have no problem. You know, wouldn't be anything fancy. Clearly, we're not a fancy show here, but, you know, we would still give them the respect they deserve. So, George Milis, welcome to the Horror Hall of Fame, and thank you. Thank you for your horror service. Uh, you were the first person in the horror community to even know that was going to be the name of the genre, and yet here we are all these years later. So, uh, so let's get into the movies. Like I said, we have two films to uh, rank here in uh, 1924. Uh, the only two horror films that have survived and you know made it. So we're going to kick things off with the winner of the Silver Skull Award, ranked number two, Waxworks. 
Uh, yes, Waxworks is about uh, it's a, a German film, and it's about this guy who owns like a wax museum uh, with all these different kind of like horrible characters, you know, the dregs of society, if you will, uh, the infamous murderers or whatnot uh, throughout history. And so he's wanting uh, this writer to kind of write these uh, stories, and he don't care if they're real or fake or whatever. He wants them to, you know, write them down and go ahead and put them in the, uh, you know, I guess on the placard uh, in front of these uh, wax, you know, sculptures. And so anyways, this writer does it. And of course, uh, he kind of, you know, as he's writing it, we're seeing like the fantasy version of that. And of course, he's just kind of putting himself and the guy who owns the wax uh, museum's daughter uh, in each of them. And they're like lovers in each story. Um, so this is a horror anthology. And, uh, you know, it's got several uh actors who you know we've seen from before emil jennings conrad veet i'm sorry if i'm still mispronouncing that, that guy's name paul wagner uh and yeah uh the three stories we kind of focus on uh the first one and i don't remember the guy's name but he was some sort of like sultan of baghdad uh the raja halt i'm sorry again I, i'm not one to to say these names, but anyways, uh, somehow kind of Sultan in Baghdad. That's the first story. Uh, the second story deals with uh, Ivan the Terrible, and then the last one. Uh, they say Jack the Ripper, but it turns into a Spring Hill Jack. Which I'll be honest with you, I did not know that was a difference. I thought that was just like a nickname of Jack the Ripper, and it turns out these are two totally different. One may not even be real. One of them may just be like a like an urban legend or whatever. Uh, Talking about Spring Hill Jack, of course. Uh, the only thing I knew about Spring Hill Jack initially was the short story of, from Stephen King. He did something uh, along the lines of that. Uh, beyond that, though, yeah, no idea. Uh, apparently, there was supposed to be a fourth one, and I don't remember who the fourth one was supposed to be. Uh, it was a fictional character out of a book, but uh, it was cut for whatever reason. Uh, this thing, you know, it was popular enough. Uh, it seems like it did all right at its time. Uh, a lot of people will look at this and say this kind of gave birth to the horror anthology and was kind of the uh, prototype for horror films to come however i like dead by night was one of them uh that drew a lot of inspiration from this but to me i feel like you know this was done better in two previous anthologies the uh weird tales or eerie tales or that german name i can now pronounce save my life uh or destiny i felt like both of them was you know way better than this but you know that's just my opinion um we'll get to my opinion we'll get to my review right now let me take a quick drink real quick drink All right. Um, the Waxworks, I don't know. The stories are all pretty solid. I dig each of the setups, the stories, you know, where the plot's going. But, my God, it's just dull and boring. Like, I don't know. I was just kind of over it. Right? And it just felt like you're kind of promised three stories. You only get two and then, like, partial. And I wonder if, like, that's kind of why the – Fourth one got kind of dropped off. They just didn't have enough time. I, I don't know the real reason. Uh, I'll talk to the other Academy members, see if we can figure this out. But uh, as of right now, at the current recording of this episode, I have no idea why that fourth one was dropped at all. Uh, but it kind of felt like it was probably for time. Yeah, uh, the first one, the Baghdad one, I dig the story. But it just, I don't know, the tone is just so goofy. And it's more comedic. Uh, and I, I know a lot of these older horror films, uh, a lot of them, definitely had more of that comedy vibe. It's very rare you got one that was just straight horror uh, or just straight uh, straight dark. But this was, yeah, this was played for last. At least this first one was. Um, and that's the thing, this whole, I mean, I know that's, you know, kind of the point of the anthology is supposed to be a little uneven. But, yeah, this one was just kind of, I don't know. What I liked about the Sultan one um, was... I love the look. This definitely, you know, had the German expressionistic vibe, hardcore. Uh, so much so that the, like, I just love the way Baghdad looked in this thing. And the, the palace, it was like you're looking at an M.C. Escher uh, painting. Uh, you know, you run up multiple stairs and, you know, they're, they're chasing from behind. And I don't know. It just looked like you're looking at. Baghdad, like, I don't know, you ever see, like, the, the pictures where it's like a fisheye lens and everything's kind of curved and wacky looking? It looked a lot like that. 
Uh, and I don't know, I, I really dug the set design here. But it was just the story itself, I was just kind of like, uh, and it just, I don't know, the characters were all... Like the Sultan's trying to bang the baker's wife. The baker, yeah, the baker himself is jealous. Uh, the baker tries to murder the Sultan, but then in the end, the Sultan's just like, ah, it's no big deal. I won't try to bang your wife, and the fact that you try to kill me, it's all water under the bridge. This is all just hang out. I don't know. It was just poorly written, I guess. Maybe that's the whole thing. Like, not necessarily the story, but just the stuff in between the story is what kind of, I don't know. I was kind of low on up, you know, for that right there. Uh, the second one, and they do, I will say they get progressively better story wise, but that's not saying much. The second one, uh, Ivan the Terrible, uh, Ivan the Terrible is played by Conrad Veet. Uh, and it's one of these things where, like, you know, he's torturing these people, and magically, you know, he thinks that, like, you could put their names on uh, this hourglass. And once the sands of, you know, the hourglass run out, they die. However, be, sensing, and I, it never is clear if he's. Plan on turning on the guy who makes his poisons and, you know, makes these hourglasses. Or if his, like, magician assistant is just trying to fuck the poison maker over. Either way, the magician tells the poison maker, hey, you're next. And so the magician, or sorry, the poison maker decides to uh, poison Ivan the Terrible. And so, anyways... And he didn't, didn't poison him. He puts, he puts his name on the hourglass. That's what it is. So, anyways, he kind of, you know, he, he gets wise to this, and he catches on, and I don't know, he does something with a poison maker. But then, like, he's supposed to go to this wedding, and he's afraid to go out. And, again, it's just like, well, why are you afraid to go out if you'd already, you know, clearly you, you caught the, the poison maker. But he does, but he switches places with the father of the bride. And so he makes the father of the bride... Uh, stand in his place on the chariot while he's the one driving the chariot. And sure enough, there's a hit, and someone murders the uh, bride's father, and then he shows up, and like, he's just like, how dare you guys? And it's just like, dude, like, and he, the, the father was killed with a bow and arrow from like afar. And it's like, is no one going to try to take a hit on this guy again, or are they just too afraid? So he goes into this wedding, and of course, the bride is completely upset, and it just becomes a solemn Occasion, you know, supposed to be the happiest day of this woman's life, but yet it's ruined because of the death of her father at the hands, more or less, of Ivan the Terrible. But he doesn't see it that way, and uh, yeah, he, he, he becomes a dick. I will say I love Conrad uh, Veet's uh, performance here. I really dug him in um, Oh Cabinet of Doctor Caligari, and uh, yeah, I, you know, two different performances. I like that. It's always bad when you, I mean, even in the silent era, you'll get people who just kind of do the same thing. And I was like, ah, you could have put anybody in there, but I feel like he was definitely one of these guys that was just like, nope, this dude was fucking solid throughout. And uh, he'll be in the number one film as well. Spoilers alert, but he does really good in that as well. So, uh, anyways, uh, so as he is, um, you know, throwing his party on, he goes and realizes that his name is on the hourglass and so his bride did is he'll just keep flipping the hourglass because i mean once the hourglass runs out your time's up at least that's what he thinks and so he just keeps switching it and switching it and you know and i don't know it's just one of those things where oh there's a pretty crazy torture scene here too where he uh he's torturing the girl's husband i think if i'm not mistaken there's a whole fucking sequence there i don't know it's, it's pretty crazy shit but yeah he, he keeps switching and then should just drive himself mad. I'm thinking, why are you just kick it on the side? Have sand on both sides. And you kick it to the side, and then guess what? You're fine. I don't know. Uh, but that's how the, the story ends. He just basically uh, goes insane. And it's just like, holy shit, that's a complete tonal shift from the first story. So these stories together were really long. This hour, this movie's like an hour and a half. And like this took up an hour and 20 minutes. Like we got 10 minutes left. And the one I'm actually looking forward to was Jack the Ripper slash Spring Hill Jack. Because I was like, hey, Jack the Ripper, awesome. Not what he did, obviously, in real life. I'm just saying, from a storyline perspective, as a character, awesome. Uh, and I didn't know anything about Spring Hill Jack, so I was hoping to learn a little bit, even if it is kind of a bastardized version. That's the other thing. What happens is, in the very beginning, that Sultan loses an arm. The, the uh, Sorry, the uh, wax figure does. So he makes up this ridiculous story about how he lost his arm. So, I mean, clearly these are going to be made-up stories. So I wasn't going to get like, a complete history lesson, obviously. I'll have to wait go to Wikipedia to find out about Spring Hill Jack and its complete form. But I was hoping to see something here. And like I said, we got ten minutes left. And I was like, really? And we don't even get the story. What we end up getting 
is as he's writing the story about Spring Hill Jack, he falls asleep and he just has this crazy dream sequence um, where Spring Hill Jack's uh, wax figure comes to life and is stalking him and the wax museum's daughter, owner's daughter, sorry. And so we get that, like this weird psychedelic freak out scene for like, I don't know, five to six minutes, seven minutes, something like that. I don't know. We don't get the full ten minutes, but we get, that's it. And I mean, don't get wrong, it looks pretty crazy. It looks good. Like, I was digging it. It had, you know, this crazy, it felt like a nightmare. It really did. But that was it. And then, like, he wakes up, and he's like, oh, I've been sleeping too much. And then, that's it. They end the movie. And it's just like, why? Why do we have to do this? I don't know. It, it, it felt kind of weak sauce at the end there. And I'm not sure why they did it that way or why this is kind of praised by people. But either way, um, this, would be, this would go on to get kind of remade uh, slightly. I know the movie Waxworks that came out in the 80s, it was loosely, and I mean loosely, uh, a remake of this. And I want to say maybe some of the stories themselves would go on to kind of get... Um, you know, solo treatments throughout the, you know, history of horror. But, uh, yeah, as far as this one goes, honestly, was not a huge fan. Uh, you know, again, sorry, just not for me. But, uh, again, it would go on to inspire countless, numerous, um, you know, anthology horror films, and this would be kind of the place they, you know, worked their way back from. Uh, this has a 6.6 .6 on uh, IMDb, which kind of shocks me, actually, because... I don't get it. I just don't get it. But that's just me. So, Silver Skull Award winner, number two horror film in 1924, Waxworks. So let's now move on to the Golden Skull, the number one horror film in 1924, The Hands of Orlock. This is an Austrian film. Uh, basically, Conrad Veet, Vertit, Vertit, I don't, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm a redneck from Bedford, Indiana. I do apologize. Uh, Conrad Verdi, he uh, would go ahead. He's, he plays in this one. He's the lead. Uh, he plays a uh, pianist. He's a world-famous pianist. However, there's a train accident, and he loses his hands. However, the doctors would you know get him brand new hands. They would graft on someone else's hands. Uh, unknown to him, though, they would be the hands of a serial killer or a murderer. Sorry, I don't think he actually killed more than one, but a murderer nonetheless. And so that's the premise here. Uh, this film, again, you know, would go on to inspire a lot. Of, you know, a lot of people really like this one, and it would get remade a handful of times. Uh, the interesting thing about this thing was uh, that it dealt with themes. Which I think is kind of funny because even to this day we, we still kind of skish about certain things when it comes to this. But it dealt with the fear of like surgery or new medical advances. Like again, you know, at this point in time, you know, you couldn't graft hands onto somebody or you know do kind of, some kind of organ transplant like that. We're still in the very beginning stages, and a lot of the reviews, you know, people who you know, and again, this kind of was like hit hit or miss in the middle here. Uh, some people liked it, some people didn't. It would get more of a following years later but uh you know a lot of people who were down on this was kind of down on because of that fear of you know we don't you know medical science has only come so far we don't want that you know here and so it really did kind of strike this you know nerve with the community and i thought you know that's kind of interesting because we would see this you know kind of play out in fact that's what a lot of the sci-fi horror was about was more of the fear of you know science and medicine and you know Surgery, really. I mean, just the techniques. You know, it's all. It's a, you know, at this time, it would be science fiction almost, uh, and that fear, you know, derived from that. So, you know, there's lots of themes of that here at play. Uh, the interesting thing about this was when it did come out, uh, and I should mention, sorry, that this is directed by Robert Wine, uh, the guy who did the uh, oh Cabinet Doctor Caligari, uh, along with you know other movies we've done. I think he did Destiny, if I'm not mistaken, or that F. W. Monroe. I think it's over on. It doesn't matter anyway. Uh, but he's you know he's done a handful of stuff for us already here on the uh, Retro Horror Academy. We've covered you know his films, and uh, yeah, uh, the other kind of funny thing about this was when it came out, there was an outcry from uh, certain law enforcement uh, because you're dealing with you know these murders happen, and with, I guess without I guess I mean it's, it's fuck it's over 100 years old or almost 100 years old. Sorry, it's 99 years old right now. Uh, but you know the ending you find out that, you know, this killer basically used 
like these rubber gloves that had the prints of the killer uh, on them, the, 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 the dead killer, the one who's dead right now. Uh, so there's a totally separate killer doing these killings with these gloves. So the prints are all matching the hands that belong to our protagonist. And I guess the local police, you know, was just like, no, we can't show anybody this because they're going to get the idea that this is how you can, you know, crack the code and become a murderer and get away with it by using someone else's prints. And it actually went to, like, whatever, I guess, the equivalent of, like, a Supreme Court would be over in the, I think it's the U.K. that challenged this initially. Uh, or maybe it was France. I don't remember. One of the two. But uh, either way, one of these countries, you know, fought against it. However, I guess they actually did bring in, like, specialists who did specialize in, uh, you know, doing prints at, you know, crime scenes. And they're just like, no, this is complete fantasy and nonsense like that can't, can't happen i don't know if that's still the case today or not i, I don't know I, I would think like it seems like it could be possible but either way you know it was thrown out and they were able to show it uh this movie and that was really the main thing that got cut from this was you know certain death scenes and everything like that but when it uh there's multiple versions out there of this uh, that run at multiple times and everything but i think the uncut version you can pretty much find anywhere i found it on roku of all places i uh, just typed it in and i forget which channel it came up on but you know came up there um this one i really dug because one of the uh um or sorry i dug the look of it not finishing my sentences just throwing shit out there it's like i have add or something uh one thing i really liked about it was with the look of this film one of the uh reviewers and i don't remember if it was the old reviewer uh from the time or if it was a retro review later on in the future but either way they said this was almost like a weird gap or a bridge between that german expressive look and a natural look and it is it's very you know the architecture you, you still have the kind of uh you know pointed archways and you know the buildings are kind of overlapping each other but it's all done in a realistic way where it doesn't feel like it's too surreal much like his previous work and i kind of feel like that's kind of a good accomplishment there because he's not just doing the same movie over and over uh in fact he's kind of growing and i don't know if that credit goes to robert wine or if there's an actual uh set you know designer who you should give credit to but either way you know i, I really i really kind of dug that because again when i was watching the previous one that was german expressionistic out the ass it was literally just raping you with german expressionism and here it's a little bit more subdued uh there's definitely traces of it but for the most part it, it takes place in a modern time uh realistically and i i, I don't know so, there's something to be said about that i really dig that uh as far as my thoughts for this movie go, I, you know, I think Conrad Veet did a really good job. Uh, I dug the story. I, again, this is a story that uh, in variants would get repeated over and over uh, with, you know, killer hands or killer, you know, serial killer's eyeballs or whatever. You've seen versions of this, you know, play out. Uh, I think the thing that's kind of disappointing, and I guess I'm entering spoiler territory, so I guess if you hadn't seen this, this is pretty much the end of the episode anyways. You can turn us off go check out the movie and then come back uh but you know again he you know he has the killer's hands and you know he's act it's more like it's more in his head than an actual demon possession or a ghost possession or whatever uh which i think he portrayed greatly in fact uh conrad uh verdi i won't call him verdi i'm sorry guys if i'm mispronouncing that give me hell in the comments section uh but conrad verdi i love his descent into this other personality even though it's all in his head he's so paranoid and he's so i don't know he's so worried that this is going to happen that he kind of psychs himself into it uh but i think this is the best i don't know visually and acting wise this is the best like double personality we've seen uh you know at this point i think we've reviewed and covered three different dr jekyll and mr hyde's and yeah honestly i think this guy did it better than any of them up until this point, uh, him going, you know, him just up at night with his knife slashing into midair. It's just like, and then to kind of see the horrified look on his face as he believes his body is taken over. I thought that was just brilliant. I really did. I thought he just did a great job there. Uh, I love, and I'm blanking on her name. And I apologize. The actress that played his wife, uh, Mrs. Orlock. Um, did I mention this movie's name? The, the hands of Orlock. I'm sure I did. Uh, anyways, Mrs. Orlock. Um, I thought she did really great. Literally, uh, she, you know, I, the character I didn't like, but I just, I don't know, the fact that she goes into, like, madness herself, I loved. Because, again, 
when she finds out that her husband's hands, or when she finds her husband in an accident, she's just like, oh my God, you know, please save my husband. And they're like, oh yeah, we saved him, no problem. But his hands, and then she just fucking flips. Like, she collapses, she faints, she's just like, my, you know, I just imagine, you always see like the stereotypical, you know, at a funeral scene, it's the kind of overweight, older African-American woman just, Lordy, please take me! And like jumping, throwing herself onto the, casket as a lower i felt like she was acting that way like oh lordy please don't take his hands do something fix his hand and it's just like what and so anyways i just i don't know i don't know why at first and i'm still kind of thinking maybe it is more of the uh it's her um she's a gold digger in a way because i mean i feel like that's the only reason she wanted it at first it seems like well maybe he, she just wants to like she believes in his mind he won't be happy unless he's playing the you know piano but it, as the movie goes on you realize like it's kind of second you know right to him like he's more concerned about possibly being a killer and can give a shit about the piano and so i don't know why she was pushing so hard for it but you just see her get like when you first see her in the very beginning when she gets a love letter from her husband on the road and she's just, she can't wait to see him. And she's very beautiful. But then as the accident happens, she gets a little frazzled and her hair's a little crazy. And then by like I said, by the time he comes back and you think maybe he is the killer, her hair is just completely just psychotic. Like it's just, she looks fucking insane. And it's just, I don't know, it works perfectly here. Um, the housekeeper, bit of a cunt. Uh, I don't, again, I don't know what her end game was. She's helping the real killer with this plan all along. Uh, her performance is so off because like, there'll be scenes where like she'll be sitting there listening in on eavesdropping and then it's like she's glee or no, she's like distraught. She's just like, oh no. And when she confronts the killer, she's all, you know, the, the real killer. Uh, you know, she seems like, you know, get out of here. You're a horrible person. But then when she's putting the plan in motion, she seems almost happy that the uh, mistress of the house, uh, the the wife, you know, Mrs. Orlock, is distraught, and she I don't know. There's a scene where she just like turns to the camera and kind of smiles, and you're just like, what? So I don't know. That performance is a little off to me, but it is what it is, and I'll let it slide. Uh, again, everything's supposed to be kind of over the top, expression wise. So you know, maybe she just took it a little too far there. Uh, but then you get the real killer, and that's the I guess I should mention. You find out that is the assistant of the doctor who did the transplant. He uh, apparently. He, framed a guy with this one murder and then when they found out they was going to transplant the hands he decided that he would uh you know go after first kind of torment the uh you know doctor mr orlock but then when he found out that orlock's uh, father was rich and was going to leave him you know behind a huge you know settlement uh, an inheritance sorry um he decides to you know kill him Pin it on Orlock so he can use that to blackmail him into, you know, giving him, you know, a million dollars or a million whatever they have in Austria. Uh, Franks? Is it Franks? I don't know. Anyways, uh, but that, you know, that, that's kind of, you know, the whole thing there. And I thought that guy did really good. Uh, weirdly enough, I mean, I guess he sees him in the window and, again, it looks like it's in his head. Like his wife, at one part, Dr. Orlock, as he's, you know, Rosie he has these different hands. And before he finds out it's a serial killer or a murderer's hands, he looks up in the window, sees the assistant. Now, again, we don't know he's the assistant yet. You know, this comes a little bit later. But he sees the assistant. He's like, oh, my God, there he is. He's smiling. Don't you see him? And the wife turns. We don't see nothing. But then he, he's still acting like, oh, my God, you know, he's grinning now. Why is he grinning? What does he want? And he would go on to have, you know, nightmares about this guy, which, again, these scenes are, you know, really well done. But it just seems like, man, he's getting paranoid, like, right out the gate before he even knows anything. Like, he's jumped to some major fucking conclusions. Uh, but anyway, I thought, the, you know, the guy who played the killer did a really good job. Uh, yeah, like I said, overall, I like this. Uh, you know, it ran a little long. The ending was a little whatever. Um, I guess I was hoping for Supernatural. I guess we don't really get full Supernatural for a while. Uh, and horror, with the exception, I guess, of Nosferatu, but beyond that, you know, we don't get that, but I thought, I was hoping this was going to be a case of, like, oh, no, it's the killer's hands, and his soul is somehow, you know, taking over, you know, Orlock, but it's not the case, it's very Scooby-Doo, we find out, hey, you're the actual killer, and all that stuff in the end, so, uh, The Hands of Orlock is the Golden Skull winner, number one film, and then the, re you know, recap, the Silver Skull went to Waxworks, our number two horror film of 1924. And our Hall of Fame inductee is George Milas. So, there you guys have it. That is 1924 in horror. 
thank you for joining me. Come back next time when we tackle 1925. That's all I have. Oh, I guess I should uh, throw out the, uh, the rating. Sorry, I forgot to mention that uh, the Hands of Orlock uh, actually had a 91% on Rotten Tomatoes and a 7.0 uh, on IMDb. So, I mean, it's you know highly regarded. I, so I think it's all right. I think, uh, again, uh, for what it is, it's not the best silent horror film out there, but it's up there. I'd say it's probably in the top five. I've yet to rank these. I should maybe rank these at some point. But either way, that's that. That's all we got. So thank you for joining us. Join us next time, 1925. Uh, This is the Retro Horror Academy. My name is Daniel Richardson, and uh, you're dismissed.